tutorial and um, I'm also testing a product. Today I'm testing the Fluid 100 watercolor paper. Uh, I've used Fluid watercolor paper for several years now. I use them primarily for convention commissions, but I also use them for um, when I do Copic stuff and I want a heavier paper or when I'm doing Copic and watercolor mixed media. Um, the difference between Fluid 100 and Fluid watercolor paper is that Fluid 100 uh, watercolor paper is 100% cotton, whereas fluid watercolor paper is um, wood pulp based. And if you're interested in the review, you should check out my blog, natasoup.blogspot.com, because um, I'm going to primarily focus on doing the tutorial today. So I've already got my line, line art inked, and I inked it with a Sailor Mitsuo Ida brush pin. They're waterproof and Copic proof and you can get them from JetPins, JetPins.com. Um, they're about five dollars, six dollars, but they last pretty much forever. Um, over here you will see my self-assembled watercolor set. It is mostly made up of Winsor Newton half pans, although there are some tube pigments that I've already placed in pans and uh, some of these desperately need to be refilled. Um, you also see two water cups, one for clean water, one for uh, dirty water, my plastic pan, which is seen better days, um, a paper towel, and several um, watercolor brushes. Most of these are, um, my Utrecht brushes are synthetic brushes. They're not my favorite, but they're just used to apply a lot of water quickly. There's also some Creative Mark brushes. Um, and a Creative Mark Rhapsody. So most of these are um, hair and synthetic combos. My preference is hair, uh, natural, natural hair fibers, but I have a cat who likes to eat my brushes and some, somewhere along the way I've acquired moths that like to nest in my brushes, which is gross. So um, I've had to get rid of a lot of my natural hair brushes and I can't afford to replace them just yet. But in my opinion, natural is the way to go if you can afford it. You really don't need that many. Um, if you like to do little things like this, you need a zero, a two, a four, and a six. Um, if you like to work bigger, then um, depending on your size, when I do my 11 by 14 watercolors, I like to, I also have small illustrations or small details in those. So I still need that too. Um, four, six, eight, and um, a mop. And your mop can be 100% synthetic. This is a Cotman mop. It works perfectly well. Um, if you want larger brushes, I happen to really like these synthetic mimic brushes from um, Jerry's Artorama. They are much more affordable than natural hair brushes in this size. Um, I do recommend you wait until Jerry's is having a sale, but if you have a Jerry's in your area, they are pretty much always having a sale of some sort, so you can always get a good deal. So uh, I'm going to start by laying down a wash. And to do that, I'm gonna put just a little bit of water. Um, when I'm doing comic style watercolors and I want consistency with my colors, I'll pre-mix most of my colors. But if I'm doing like floral paintings, I will mix them on the white enamel coated metal. So you just wanna apply some water to the pans you're gonna be mixing. And some of them, like this blue, which is actually two pans put together, um, of two different blues. I found that it makes a really nice sky blue when mixed. They take the water and release pigments very quickly, but other, um, other pans may not activate as fast. And I just grabbed a clean tissue because I realized that um, I'm probably gonna want to blot out something after I've applied the water. And this isn't really the best wash brush for this, but given the size, I think it'll be okay. So right now I'm just doing an overall wash of blue, as in the blue sky. Um, after I've done this overall wash, I'm going to blot out areas of Kara skin that I don't want to be affected by that. And um, it's hard to see with such a light color, but the paper towel picks up the blue pretty quickly. You want to get that get on picking that excess color up as soon as you possibly can. Otherwise, um, you're just never going to be able to get that out of the skin. But right now, let me zoom in for you guys and move my... There. Um, 
I got most of it out. So the next thing I wanna do is I actually wanna apply a darker line at the top of the sky. And it's okay if it goes into her hair because she's got kind of dark red-brown hair. It's not a big deal. And by blotting out the skin, it actually means uh, the pigment doesn't get sucked into that wet area. So um, don't even necessarily need to mask it. Although I'm gonna go back in with a little corner of my paper towel and just, I don't even have to do this because uh, that is an area that would be shaded anyway. But I'm just gonna pick that up. So while this is wet, I'm gonna go ahead and start mixing um, the first green. And I'll zoom out there so you guys can see. Um, and I'm just gonna mix it on this tray since color accuracy isn't the biggest deal. And I'm sorry about the rattling. Um, that's the top of the tray hitting the, my uh, desk organizer. And I wanna do this while it's wet because I kinda want my first layer of green to be diffused. Um, I have another watercolor painting I did much larger than this on Arches paper where the grass, the way I applied the grass, it diffused. Um, and it looks really cool like that. So I'm kind of replicating that here since she is again walking in grass. And some of my areas have already pretty much dried. So need to work a little faster if I wanna take advantage of techniques like that. Cause you see it diffused really nicely up there and it's not doing that down here. Not as well. And if you have an excess of paint like I do over here, you can just dry off your brush a bit and uh, soak it right up, very easy to do. So I'm going to, um, you know what? I think I'm actually going to wet that pan over there in a blue and um, mix a shadow green and that way it'll kind of diffuse into that grass, bright grass green. And then I think I might let my painting dry a little bit before I move forward. So for the shadow green, I'm just putting it kind of in the background. I want to leave some of the foreground green bright. There, I think that's probably fine for now. And I will be going over it several times with more green. I just wanted to influence um, what I had already. So I'm gonna allow this to fully dry and then I'll get back with you. Actually, now that I'm looking at it, I think I'm going to suck up some of the blue wash over there. And I think I actually wanna darken it a little bit, just at the very top. And then I'm gonna let it dry. So that's the problem with me doing tutorials. I always, there's always something else I could do. Okay. Now you really shouldn't let your watercolor dry um, flat. You should um, prop it up. So I'm actually gonna just use a little post-it note pad to just put a slight angle on it. Maybe grab another, cause I think I'd like it actually, this tea tin would work. Cause watercolors work their magic. Even watercolors for comics work their magic best when the, the pigments can kind of move on their own. So I'm gonna let this dry and then we'll continue. So my piece is dry and I went ahead and removed the little thing I'm gonna use to prop it up while it dries. Um, I mean, it's not 110% dry. It's dry to the touch. It's still a little bit cool. If you want, if you need to let something dry completely, it should no longer be cool to the touch. But this is dry enough that it shouldn't cause bleeding issues. And I'm just going to be painting in some of the grass right now. So even if it does um, start to bleed on me, it's not a really big deal. So I'm mixing up kind of a nice spring green with a hunter's green. I think it's a Daniel Smith hunter's green and it's one of the most beautiful hunter's greens, hunter greens I've ever seen. I've tested a few of them. And Windsor Newton olive green, which is like, or maybe green gold. I think it might be green gold, which is another beautiful color that as you build up saturation, it kind of changes. It starts out as like a very yellow, um, kind of a chartreuse color but as you build up color, it 
it deepens and intensifies, which is, um, it's something I love about that color. And I'm not worried about the green that's bled into Kara, um, partially because that will be red as a cast shadow. In fact, I'm even gonna put some on her other leg. It's gonna be red as a cast shadow, so it's gonna influence the local, it's considered, it's called local color, and um, it's basically the shadow or the light affected by the objects around you. And since she's walking in grass, that green makes sense, like visual sense. And that's uh, the paints doing my work for me, which I'm always quite happy to allow it to do. And I'm not trying to fill in the whole area necessarily. I want to, um, and see over here, it kind of bled out and that's fine, but I want to um, leave areas that don't get covered entirely. Let me zoom in so you guys can see that. Because it's gonna read more as grass strokes than if I colored in the entire thing. If your grass starts looking swampy, it's because there isn't enough um, contrast in your grass and you might be using too many colors. I'm just gonna go in and knock in some quick blades of grass over here, taking care to leave space in between and not, and also to not color in the entire blade. I want it to look like lights hitting each grass unique, in a unique way. All right, so I'm gonna allow that to dry. So something neat about foliage, including grass, is that the closer the fo foliage is to the sun, the more yellow it's gonna be, but that's also true for the closer the foliage is to the viewer. Um, so down here, maybe around the sides would be more blue, and the tips that are reaching towards the sun would retain kind of a yellowish cast. That's just something to think about when you're painting. Um, you also want your lightest gray, green, I'm sorry, not necessarily um, your most yellow green, but your lightest shade of green, lightest and least saturated towards the back. It's going to make your grass visually recede to the viewer, and you want the most detail to be in the front closest to the viewer. I know that sounds like common sense, but it's the sort of thing we lose track of sometimes when we're painting or we forget to do. So I'm gonna allow the grass to dry a little bit more. Um, and then I'm probably gonna go back into it and start adding the blue shadows towards the bottom. All right, so my grass is now pretty much green and I'm going to start adding some shadow in with a nice blue green. Um, I think it's a pyrrolene blue and here's some indigo that I had um, had out for, from some of my flower illustrations. And um, my brush is a little bit big, that's okay. You really want to um, use as large a brush as you can when you're painting because one of the things that leads to muddiness is working with too small a brush, not having distinct brush strokes. It's actually very hard for me to talk and paint and be on the edge of the table. Let me just move over a little bit like that, I think. And I'm mostly just trying to knock in some of the shadows and it's okay if you need to rotate your canvas. And you see this pyrrolene blue indigo mix um, already is creating some depth with pretty, pretty minimal effort on my part. And um, watercolor always dries lighter than what you put on. So the blue you see here is actually gonna draw lighter and more transparent. So it's not gonna stand out nearly as much. And if I happen to like that depth of blue, which I do, it's going to take a couple more layers to build that blue up again. So I'm going to let that dry. And um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and start mixing her skin tone, even though I'm not going to use it for a bit. So when I mix a skin tone, I like to mix like um, a scarlet lake kind of color or um, scarlet hue. Then I also mix in a little bit of, um, like yellow ochre. 
and I have many yellow ochres as you can see because I mix a lot of skin tones and I'm just going to let the water activate the pigments for a minute. Oh man, you couldn't see the red. Oh well, it's not the end of the world. I just um, dabbed a little bit of water onto a yellow ochre and a scarlet lake. The scarlet lake right there and that yellow ochre right there. Um, and I'm gonna be mixing them in one of my paint wells. So I'm taking some clean water with an eyedropper. These are super handy to have around your studio. Um, you can buy them in bulk. I think I bought like 300 from Amazon a few years ago and I'm just now starting to run, um, kind of run out. And um, when you're mixing colors, if you, I recommend using a synthetic brush to like uh, pick up those pigments because you can ruin a nicer brush by scrubbing it against your your dried and crusty and gross looking pans. So that might be too pink. I also recommend um, having a piece of scratch paper nearby that you can swatch colors on just to see how it looks. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna clean my brush first. That way I'll get a more accurate representation of what the color looks like. And I'm gonna grab a piece of scrap paper. This one right here. I always keep some scrap watercolor paper by my drafting table. And I'm just gonna apply it and let it dry and see how it looks. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and um, allow these things to dry and get back with you guys. My grass is mostly dry and I think I'm gonna add another layer of green just cause there's a bit of um, disparity between the blue shadows and the green of the grass. So I'm going back in with that hunter's green, mixed it up a bit on my palette, just darkening the le uh, the blades of grass in my foreground, making them more leafy green. And that kind of goes into that whole um, contrast thing I brought up earlier in the tutorial. Um, I want my foreground to be darker than my background to push the distance. And sometimes that can be a little difficult to build up with watercolor because you don't want to go too dark because one of the wonderful qualities of watercolor is your ability to build up tones uh, over time. And I'm gonna allow that to dry propped up. And I'm gonna zoom in so my next shot will be, you can see what I'm doing a little bit better. All right, so we're almost done with the grass. I just want to do one more layer, sort of a blue-green, down um, down where the blades meet the bottom of the page. And I am mixing it over here on the side. Um, I want to lighten that up a bit. And I'm trying to keep my brush strokes um, blade-like, just to reinforce the shape of the grass. You don't want to scrub your color on because that's going to kill all the work you put in defining individual blades. It's going to make your grass look muddy and marshy and not like grass at all. So by doing individual strokes, you can help preserve the fact that it looks like grass. And um, if you so decide, you can go in one more time with um, say an indigo and put in shadows. So I may make a layer of myself and go ahead and do that. So this wouldn't be my last layer of grass. Or when you're finished with the, the like liquid portion of your watercolors, you might decide to go in with some wonderful watercolor pencils like Derwent Intense watercolor pencils, which are my favorite, or even color pencils and um, sort of add details to your grass. When I'm done, I'm probably gonna go in with um, a white color pencil and add some reflections, just a little bit to the tips of the grass, sort of like catching the sunlight. And that's really easy to do. I can show you guys how to do that a little bit later on. So I'm gonna let this grass dry and then I'm gonna start in with Kara's skin. 
Okay, so my grass is mostly dry. I'm going to take one of the smaller watercolor brushes. This one is the size two Polinsky Sable brush from, um, it's a Creative Mark Rhapsody brush from Jerry's Artorama. I find these brushes to be great. They're very affordable. Um, the fibers are nice, although a little bit short, which doesn't bother me as I'm heavy handed. And I'm going into my indigo. It's a Winsor Newton indigo, and this batch is actually more of a blue green than a blue gray or um, a true indigo. And I'm just going to add some very fine shadows on the grass. And like I said, this brush is great. It's so good that I even ink with a size zero, zero from um, the same line very affordable too. So if you're looking to get started with watercoloring, um, I really recommend you check that brand out. Especially if you have a Jerry's Artorama in your area and you can just pop over and take a look in person and take advantage of some um, non-website deals. They tend to have in-person sales often, but I haven't noticed their website having too many sales. And um, if possible, you wanna have a little more room to work than I do. Your arm should be resting on your table or your surface if you can for support. It's going to give you um, more control over your brush. Unfortunately, because I am recording in a kind of a limited space, I can move some things, but I wanted you guys to be able to see the colors I was using to mix with and the materials I was using to paint with. So I sort of limited my space, but if, you can give yourself lots of room. I highly recommend it. That's why I usually paint on the floor. So I've just added in those shadows. As you can see, it really makes the grass pop. It gives it dimension. It's not just a mushy mess. I'm going to allow that to dry and then I'm gonna actually, for real this time, start on Kara's skin with the color I already mixed. And um, for those of you curious, when that color is dry, it looks like this. So it's a nice Caucasian skin tone. All right, so my grass is mostly dry. It's time to get started with the skin. I'm going to start with a clean, and I'm making sure it's clean because I just rinsed it out in the clean water. Um, let me pull out a little bit so you guys can better see what I'm doing. Um, clean watercolor bucket, water bucket, sorry. And I'm just doing a base application right now. Now, some people like to leave um, white as a highlight on the skin, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I don't usually do that, um, just because that wasn't the way that I learned. But if you want a more manga or sort of appearance, a lot of manga artists will use that technique where they're only applying color in the shadows. Um, which results in a much lighter feeling overall watercolor illustration, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and you can do that either by just not painting over it, or you can use a wax, a white, like a clear, let me see if I have one nearby. Mm, yes, you can use, sorry about that noise, a clear wax crayon and that's going to go onto your paper completely clear it's not going to leave any sort of like a white or colored residue you can use that you could use a white crayon if you want or even a color crayon if you want because it's going to form or resist or you can put masking fluid down allow it to dry and then remove the masking fluid when you're finished it's all a matter of what you're comfortable with and what you feel like doing so that's the first layer of kara skin tone i'm going to um I'm gonna let that dry and start applying subsequent layers. So I will get back to you. My skin is dry and the trick with skin is if you want strong, um, strong lines, strong contrast, then you need to let your first layer dry completely. Otherwise it's going to blend out. And if you happen to get some color where you don't want it, you can just suck it up with a piece of paper towel. Um, I like to use Viva paper towels by Kleenex as um, they're very strong and they don't have an obvious weave so they don't leave texture marks on the paper. They can also be used for a really long time so long as you don't just like completely wreck them. Um, I know some people rinse them out and hang them up 
Uh, I'm not to that level yet of dedication, but um, I mean, that's just a testament to how great they are for watercolor. And I am under no uh, sponsorship from Kleenex to say that. I'm just a fan. So um, on the second layer of watercolor, I am leaving certain parts. Let me zoom in so you guys can see. I'm leaving certain parts uncolored. And I went ahead and filled in all of the neck area, because that would be a cast shadow. The arm, that would be in shadow right here. The bottom part of that arm, leaving the top arm. This whole arm and that leg, that's in shadow. And now I'm moving on to the face. I'm, I'm doing the whole ear. And this Mimic brush is not, is it Mimic? No, it says it's squirrel, but it's not a very good squirrel. It's kind of floppy and it wants to put paint where paint doesn't need to go. So maybe avoid this creative mark brush because I, I've, I, I've had bad experiences with them in the past. Um, so I'm gonna zoom in so you guys can see where I apply shadow to the face. I definitely apply shadow where her bangs overlap her face. And to help build contrast, there's usually one side of the face that's more in shadow than the other. And uh, so that's pretty much how I do it. And this might not be enough contrast. If you want to build up more contrast, there's two ways you can do that. You can mix more pigments into your well. Um, I find that changes the color sometimes of what I've mixed in a way that I don't like or you can allow your water to evaporate for a while and thus get darker. My leg has dried, so I'm gonna go ahead and add another layer down there. And this arm looks like it's dried too. So I'm gonna let this dry and then I'm gonna show you guys how I apply blush to the face in watercolor. All right, so my skin has dried and it's time to mix a skin tone. And I mean, a blush. And I like using Alizarian Crimson. This is my secondary set with a little bit of orange in it. And I'm gonna go ahead and mix them over here because you really don't need much. Um, fortunately, this brush doesn't wanna release it too well. And then you wanna clean your brush because that's gonna be a very intense pink right off the bat. And that's from my secondary set of watercolors, which I use often for painting people and for painting my comics, but not so much when I'm doing um, floral stuff. So I'm gonna take a little bit of it. And I guess I gotta adjust the camera again. All right. And I apply blush to the cheekbones and across the bridge of the nose, underneath the nose, along where the head meets the neck, into the eyebrows, on the elbows, on the joints of the finger, and pretty much where skin meets skin and it looks very oh oh of course on the lips so it looks really stark right now very um intense it'll dry a little bit lighter but I want to blend it out a bit and I really should have blended the pink out as soon as I applied it because now it doesn't want to budge with this brush and then I'm gonna go back in and intensify the blush on her cheeks by adding another level layer, sorry. Blend that out a little bit and I'm going to let that dry and then I'm gonna go back over it with the, um, the skin tone I had mixed because that's a uh, part of my process for building up skin tone. But while I do that, I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit of water 
to the pans that I use for Kara's hair. You can tell I need to replace that one and that one there. And this one wants to pop out. You just fix it really quick. And I have my pans held into my metal um, palette with a little bit of fold folded over washi tape or double stick tape. There are palettes that um, you can buy pans where there's a little magnet on the bottom and you can just stick them in and that's nice too. Um, I just buy cheap plastic pans um, or pre-filled Winsor Newton pans. So it looks like that's dried and I can go ahead and start painting her skin again. And now that I think about it, I think I'm gonna use that number two Creative Mark Rhapsody brush that I did the, the grass with. And it's clean, I just made sure it was clean. Always wanna make sure it's clean, especially if the last color you worked with is something like a green, which would look really rough on the skin. And um, I really need to let allow this to evaporate more because the contrast isn't as stark as I would like, as strong as I would like. And um, that's how you end up, or that's how I often end up with muddy paintings. It's re there's really two ways. The first way is there's not enough contrast, so everything is the same value and boring. Or um, the paper I'm using isn't very good and all of the pigments pick up every time I add a new layer and everything turns to mush. So I'm going to mix her skin tone a little bit stronger. And you do that just by adding more pigment to your water mixture. And you're gonna wanna swatch it to make sure everything lines up. So there's my swatch of watercolor paper. Here's my original. Here's my second. I'm gonna layer it on top to see how it looks. And I'm gonna allow it to dry and then adjust as necessary. All right, so my skin has had plenty of time to dry. As you can see, I did a pretty good job matching my uh, skin tones. So now it's time to apply another layer. I mean, that's really the trick with watercolor is, at least the way I do watercolors, lots of layers, lots of patience. Um, when I teach in-person watercolor classes, I usually tell my class to go ahead and work on a couple of other things while they're painting. When I'm painting seven inch Kara, I usually paint like four to six pages at any given time. And if uh, I don't have additional pages to paint, I was working on Gizmo Grandma or personal illustrations. And that helps me, um, somebody with ADHD, somebody who has this need to be busy, um, it helps me not overwork something too quickly. It gives my pieces time to dry. It also means my output is um, pretty high because I'm always doing something while my other things are drying. So we're getting nice contrast there. That's a, that's a good, um, amount of contrast and it's gonna dry a little bit lighter, but that's okay with me. So I'm gonna show you guys how we're going to mix this shadow tint for her skin. And to do that, you want um, you want the complement of skin, which for Caucasian skin would be a purple, depending on your circumstances. And uh, I'm gonna go with like this light fuchsia color here, which looks like that. And I've already got some down here, so I'm gonna get that started. And um, you also maybe want um, like a little bit of an indigo. And since my current indigo isn't indigo at all, I'm actually using um, this gray blue from um, Daniel Smith to mix up my color. So that's it right there. And I don't mind if it dries out because I can reconstitute it. I can add water to it. Um, I do want my skin tone to be fully dry though before I apply it. So I'm gonna let that dry and I'll get back with you guys. All right, so my skin is dry and it's time to apply 
my first bit of the shadow color. And you want to apply that wherever the sun would cast a, um, a strong direct shadow. Because this shadow is caused by absence of light. So maybe a little bit under the nose, under the lips, where the bangs cover the face. And you can also see where it's very striking right there. You can blend it out with water. So let's clean that brush, get some clean water, blend out that purple. And since this leg here is in the grass, it's going to get an overall coating of that purple. So I'm gonna allow this to dry and I'm going to um, assess the color, decide if I need to do more of this or more of that and get back to you guys. All right, so that purple has dried. You can see here it's a little bit cloudy, that's okay. You can remedy that with judicious application of additional layers of your skin tone. Make sure you stir your skin tone up before you reapply as some of the pigments may have settled and um, clean your brush afterwards so that it's not holding those pigments that have just been stirred up. So I'm gonna apply another layer of skin tone right there and some on her neck, although I'm pretty pleased with how her neck turned out. Some on her ear, some on her face. And I think I would like to darken the tan, I mean, the um, my mistake, the blush on her face a little bit because it's not standing out as much as I would like. And I'm gonna go ahead and add some more skin tone to this arm here. And to this leg in the grass. And I've already mixed the tone for her freckles and her hair. Um, so I'm going to allow that to dry and then we'll do We'll probably do one more layer of the purple shadow just for detail, probably on the leg, probably on this arm, um, where her bangs meet her face. Then we're gonna do the eyes and the hair. So I'm gonna let this dry and get back. All right, so that layer's dry. It's time to do a couple of additional details with that skin shadow purple we mixed up. Actually want it a little darker on the leg. And um, well-executed detail is another thing that's going to keep your watercolor from looking mushy. Unfortunately, with some papers and some paints, when you apply additional layers of color, it will pick up the original layer of pigments and redistribute them. So you might have the best of intentions and your application might have been just fine, but it could just be the paper and the pigments you're using, or even the day. When I'm painting in Louisiana, I always have a hard time because it's so humid there that I can't get I can't get the the paper to fully dry. And that means all layers I do on top of my initial layer are likely to pull up those initial pigments. So that's something else to keep in mind. But I think I think that turned out pretty pretty good. At least I'm pleased with it, and that doesn't happen all that often. Picking up a little bit of the blush color we'd mixed. And applying it to the cheeks again, just to just to make them a little little deeper, I guess. And to the fingers, because that got lost with the purple. And on her elbows again. All right, so I'm gonna let that dry and then I'm gonna show you guys how I shade the eye. Okay, so that's dry. Now it's time to do the eyeshadows. And what I wanna do is I wanna try and pick up just a little bit of blue green in addition to some um, blue gray. And maybe just dab a little bit out just to create a little more dimension since the eyes are so small. So that looks pretty good. Um, let's see if I can zoom in so you guys can see that better. 
And I can even go in with like a very fine detail brush, this one here, which is like a zero zero. And it's a synthetic brush for models, like um, car models, that kind of stuff. But it works just fine for very minute details. So I can even add just a little bitty bit more shadow into the eye and blend it out just a little bitty bit more. All right, so once that dries, I can go about painting her hair and adding the freckles. Okay, so we're ready now to do her irises, her freckles, and her hair. And I pulled in really close so you guys can see what's going on which means I have to watch the camera constantly because I can't see. So I'm taking out the detail brush. And hopefully this mixed dark enough. We'll find out by, hmm. All right, well, I don't know about that. That does not seem dark enough. No, okay. All right, so it means before I do the freckles, because I the, this is almost the same color as her skin. And since I've got you guys, I'm, and I've already started applying it, I'm going to go ahead and fill in her hair with this very light color, and I'm gonna mix it darker so we can actually get her hair started. And I should have swatched that. See, this is why it's important to swatch. Fortunately, this is not really any big loss of anything but my time. Okay, so let's pull out. And I'm just going to move that to the side for a second. And this time I am going to swatch. So see, I did learn my lesson. And here's the swatch. And it could be darker by a lot. So, um, if you're interested in watercolor, it's really a game of patience. And if you're not that patient, you might find alcohol markers to be a more suitable medium because it's very immediate and you can correct your mistakes many, many times. Huh. Still having trouble getting that color dark enough. And I do both um, because I happen to really like transparent and translucent mediums. Um, they just seem to glow from within. But I started with alcohol markers and transitioned into watercolors because the visual effect is very similar, but it's much more cost efficient for large projects. Um, so if you're interested in learning and you already own alcohol markers, then I think you should continue practicing with your alcohol markers because they are going to help you have a strong foundation in watercolor but if you don't have either there we go that's the color if you don't have either and you can be patient um or you don't mind working on several things at one time then go ahead and give watercolor a try um it's once you have your set they last a really long time um and you pretty much only need to buy the palette one time uh, you can refill your paints with paint from the tube, or you can buy replacement pan watercolors. Um, they cost, on average, pan watercolors cost about as much as a brand new Copic marker, around 7 to $8, depending on where you're getting it. So um, having a large set costs about as much as having a large set of Copics, but you can mix more colors from what you have. So really, you only need a set half this size. Part of this is just I'm addicted to art supplies and I, I have to try them all, but you could really do well with a much smaller set and be able to mix all the colors you need. So, it seems like the hair is dry on, the, on this. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, move my camera and zoom in a bit so you guys can see what I'm doing. And with hair, you wanna do fine kind of flicking strokes so you can get a nice highlight. And 
and I'm going to color in her eyes and her eyebrows and clean that. And I'm going to apply her freckles with a fine tip. Hopefully this will work okay. Yeah, I think it will. And I don't mind that they're kind of um, beaded up like that because I do want them to be a little bit darker. I want them to provide nice contrast against her skin. If they were too similar to her skin tone, it would only contribute to a muddy appearance. And with freckles at this size, it doesn't really matter. But you really don't want to draw perfect circles for freckles because freckles are not perfect circles at all. Um, and I'm going to allow all of this to dry and then I'm going to do another layer. And that includes with the freckles, depending on how, how dark they are, because freckles also naturally overlap in, um, well, here, here's my arm. See, first of all, they're not all circular. Uh, secondly, this is like my winter pale skin. So my freckles are not as dark as they normally are. But um, in the summer, my freckles are actually much darker, especially on my face. So depending on the sort of skin your character has or the person you're drawing has, um, they might have very light freckles all over their skin. Um, or they might have... Um, a few darker freckles, or they might have a combination of the two. Uh, freckles are typically on the parts of your skin that see the sun, so the tops of your arm, as opposed to the bottoms of your arm, the tops of your legs, um, along the sides of your neck, your back, uh, just depending on which areas you expose to the sun, the tops of your cheeks. So that's where you're going to want to apply your freckles and it seems like these are a little bit dark so when I do my next layer I'm going to want to make sure I apply them a little bit lighter so I'm going to pull out and I'll see you guys in a minute okay so that layer is dried now I'm going to do the next layer and it seemed like my larger brushes were able to put down a lighter layer yeah there we go that's what I thought I was going to end up with it's hard for you guys to see, so I'll try to zoom in after I'm done. And I pretty much just dot the paper with my paintbrush very gently when I'm applying freckles. Oh, I found a blade of grass that I had totally missed. So I guess I ought to go back and try to remedy that. Fleet won't ruin everything. So I'm mixing up green again. Let's see if I can do that kind of carefully. And then unfortunately, it's kind of a bluer green than what I had mixed originally, but if it dries kind of pale, that will actually be just fine. Just trying to blend it into the grass there so it doesn't look so added at the last minute. Maybe add a little yellow. Well, more like that green gold, the Windsor Newton green gold. And I guess that's okay. Maybe darken this area underneath her elbow a little bit using a blue green. And then leave it alone because I'm just gonna make it worse. So since her hair is pretty much dried, I guess I can zoom in so you can see her face. Her hair and her freckles have dried and you can see now that there's like two layers of freckles. Uh, I'm gonna start doing, gotta change the arm. There we go. I'm gonna start doing her hair with a color straight from the pan. Like with my inking tutorial video, if you need to move your palette to get the best angle, I really encourage you to do so. Don't feel like you need to stay static. A lot of YouTubers, the only reason they're keeping their canvas static is for the benefit of the viewer. It, so there's nothing wrong with um, moving around to get the best angle to do what's right for your wrist. So we're finally at the part where um, I can do several things at one time and I don't have to constantly stop the video. So that's exciting for me. 
So I'm going to do the walking stick that Kara's holding next. I guess I gotta pull out some because you guys can't see. Here we go. And right now I'm just doing a base color. I'm gonna go over it again later. So I'm not really worried about um, shading or form, I'm just worried about fill. And next I'm going to do her water flask, which is a tiny little bottle. And I'm using that, um, that gray I'd mentioned, the one from Daniel Smith. And I'm also using some Payne's Gray. We'll see how that looks. And I'm adding lots of water to it because I want it light at first. And I think the stick has pretty much dried. So I'm going to go over it with a layer of the brown I put down initially. And it looks like the hair dried too. This is where I'm just starting to like indicate some texture on the walking stick. And since her hair is dry, I can start working on that again. All right, and it seems like the bottle has dried, so I'm gonna clean my brush. Oh, I gotta clean it good because pigments are really worked into the, the hairs of the brush and the ferrule. Sorry, I'm trying to stay on camera as much as I can. I'm sorry if I dip in and out. When it's pulled in, sometimes I will move the canvas over just like one inch to get a better view of what I'm doing and it means you guys can't see anything. So I'm going to try to be more cognizant of those changes. All right, so I need to let the hair fully dry and her bottle dry a little bit more. And um, then I'll get back to you guys. All right, so the hair is dried and so has the, the water bottle. So... Now I can go ahead and add the last layer on my hair, a very dark brown, almost a black. And maybe add my last detail on the stick. Boy, it's good I'm doing such a little watercolor with you guys because if it was like a big detail watercolor page, that would take forever. Although I actually do have plans to do um, or to try to do at least a time-lapse page of 7-inch care for the channel. All right, maybe a little bit of detail in the eyes. And adding just a few details on the stick, kind of doing like um a scrubby brush kind of movement to simulate bark. And I'm not all that happy with how her hair looks in the back. So I'm going to go back a color and extend that color highlight. Into the rest of her hair. It's one of the nice things about good watercolor paper is you can work back and forth as much as you need to and it won't get too muddy. Now, time for that water bottle. And it looks like I'm gonna to need to mix my silver darker because I'm gonna to wanna to do, um, because metal tends to have like strong shadows, strong contrast on it. That's what makes it look metallic. So I'm gonna to need to mix my colors a little bit darker. I was hoping it would do a little bit of bleed. Um, I can always do that manually after the fact with um, some clean water, but it looks so much nicer and more natural when it just takes off. 
happy accidents are really the watercolorist friend, even for someone like me who does very tight, controlled watercolor comics. Um, happy accidents at the right time can really make something look fantastic. Okay, so I tried to I tried to fake it, not as nice as I would have, not as good a bloom as you would get on like Arches, for example. But it's not bad. This is actually pretty, pretty decent watercolor paper. It's an improvement over um, the original formula of Arches. Not Arches, I'm sorry, of um, Fluid. Which I, I like and I think it has its own uses. Okay, so I'm gonna allow that to dry. Maybe I'll go ahead and do the cork on her bottle. Yeah, that's a good color for the cork. So I'm gonna let all of that dry and then I'll get back to you guys. All right, so that's dry. Time to go back and um, darken that cork a little bit and um, add that kind of trademark corky 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 kind of pattern let's see if i can get it in close for you guys see like that and it's just simple straight brush strokes very short ones and i apologize if the back and forth is making you kind of sick um if that's a problem for you please leave a comment and let me know and i will not do it in further videos if it doesn't bother you at all um it's actually very useful for me and so um just don't say anything, maybe. So I think for her dress, I wanna do something really contrasty. So I'm going with like an opera rose, which is um, a synthetic pigment from Soho, which is Jerry's Artorama. Uh, that's their, their watercolor line. And it's really, it's not bad at all. They're $3 a tube. Um, they are not light fast, like at all. So just be aware of that. Um, actually, I used it on the jewel on her water carrier, not her dress. I'm gonna use a darker red on her dress. Um, anyway, going back to Soho, they are really, they're pretty decent. Not light fast, but for someone like me, I um, I pretty much scan everything I do. Uh, my pages are locked away in archival boxes after they're scanned, so you know I'm not as concerned. But if I was doing it for a commission, I wouldn't use that color unless the commissioner knew it was a fugitive color, which means that after sometimes after a very short time, just a period of months, it loses its its vibrancy. Um, I would have to make sure my commissioner knew and if they were okay with it then we could proceed with that color. If not I'm gonna have to find a substitute. But if you're just starting out, itch. Hang on. Okay. I wanted to clear off that that grass. If you're just starting out, it's really fine to start with those. Um, they're going to handle like normal watercolors, like more expensive watercolors for the most part. And once you're used to them, then you can switch to something better. They're one of the few cheap watercolors that I'm like, yeah, go ahead and get it. It's going to be okay. So I am not leaving a white highlight on the jewel and that's because I will go in with either white color pencil or white gouache and um, add a white highlight. Adding some finishing touches to the cork. And I need to decide on a color for her little pantaloons. I kind of want to avoid um, a grass color for this illustration because she's going to get further lost in the grass. Um, don't really want to do a brown. I might be boring and just do the same color as her top since that's a nice color. Nice and contrasty. I think I'm just going to apply the pigment a little more thickly on her little pants so um, 
they seem like a slightly darker shade without actually switching my paints. So now that I'm adding shade to the shirt, I'm really just blocking in the color and then I'm gonna use clean water to sort of um, blend that transition out a bit so it's not so strong. Ugh, I went through that same blade of grass like three times. I'm gonna have to, sorry, I went on that same blade of grass like three times. I'm gonna have to take like white gouache to it. There's just no two ways about it. In general, the white you can leave on your paper naturally through just not putting down pigment is going to look better than the white you apply afterwards. Um, but sometimes it's just unavoidable. And there's not, there's not, not, any reason to be ashamed of having to um, go back and add white. It just isn't going to look as good as it would have looked if you were able to leave that unmarked. Let's see if I can pick it up with the tip of my brush without ruining everything around it. I'm gonna let that this dry and then I'm going to um, finish up with the dress and maybe like try to add some yellow or something to desaturate it. I mean, where you guys are sitting, you can't even see, but there, see there. It's such, it's such a tiny piece. It's sometimes it's hard to be so accurate with such tiny watercolors, but I enjoy doing the small watercolors. So, you know, just gotta practice. All right, I'll get back with you guys in a minute. Okay, so we're almost done. We're in the final stretch. Just got to finish with the dress and finish with the jewel on her water thing. So I'm mixing that opera rose I was telling you guys about with the same red that I used on her dress just to do like a shadow on the jewel. And I think that works out pretty well. So now I just got to worry about the dress. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix a dark purple with the red from the dress. And hopefully that will take care of what I needed to do. Putting a shadow underneath the chain. Okay, so I'm gonna allow that to dry and then I'll see how I feel about it. And we had talked about me doing some yellow at the tip of that blade of grass that I kept messing up on. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Yeah, that's not bad. And maybe on this one and on that one. Yeah, I think, I think that helps in general too. Because remember we had talked about how um, yellows come toward the viewer and blues recede. So that yellow actually helped push those blades of grass closer towards the viewer. And I think that purple is looking pretty good. I wanna build it up a little bit more on her pants. And where the chain is casting a shadow. Okay, that's looking good. So the thing about, from this point forward, if we use um, color pencils or if we use watercolor pencils or basically anything with a sharp point, um, you really wanna make sure your paper is 100% dry because if it's wet, it's going to cut into your paper and cause problems later. So you just really wanna give it as much time as you can give it. Um, if it's a dry day, 30 minutes should be okay. But when I'm doing my pages um, and I've hit the time for color pencil stage, I let my pages cure for the rest of the day before moving on to co color pencils. So I'm gonna let this dry and then I'm gonna get back to you guys with, I think I'm gonna use my Derwent Color Soft color pencils just for little details here and there. Okay, so it's been about an hour since I allowed this to start drying. I think it's probably dry enough tonight that I can use my Color Soft color pencils to add some details. I happen to prefer these because they're very soft and very pigmented, so they don't scratch up your paper um, the way, say, Prismacolors, which are more waxy, um, the way Prismacolors might. I want a fresh point, and I'm gonna move my paint out of the way to give myself some room to work. 
And I think I'm gonna grab a yellow too, because I'd like to add some yellow highlights into these grass blades. And you really just need a light hand to do this. And you can use white gouache or um, a white watercolor pencil to add details if you'd like. Adding some little white reflections on the chain. And a white highlight to her jewel on her little water container. white highlight along her arm, like the sunlight is catching it at the top, and on her hand, over here as well. Okay, I think um, I might add a little bit of blue down here by her leg, and over here underneath the water bottle. Just a little bit though. And you can go back over it with watercolor to sort of merge the colors together a little bit better, which I might do. Let's find a fine point. And I mixed some indigo in with that purple and dark red I'd originally mixed for the pants. So I'm just gonna go over where I put the blue. I just want to add a little bit more of a shadow to that pink jewel. All right, I think that's about it. So I'm going to zoom in so you guys can get one last close look. So I hope you enjoyed my watercolor tutorial. Um, if you did enjoy it, if you found it useful, please hit like. That helps my rankings on YouTube. And when people search watercolor, it will allow them to find my work more easily. And consider subscribing to my channel for even more content like this. Um, if you are still hungry for more, you ought to watch what I have on my channel now. And I strongly recommend you read my blog, natosoup.blogspot.com, because there's five years worth of art supply reviews, tutorials, and process up there to get you started. I'm Becca Hilburn. I hope you guys have a nice day. Bye!